Imagine being chosen, destined to carry out God's plan for his people, your people. You've heard of God's mighty works and even seen them in your own life. God has used you to proclaim his word, to speak on his behalf of good news, prosperity, and salvation. But what if God asked you to do one more thing? What if he asked you to take the message of salvation, not to your people, but to your enemies? Would you refuse? Would you run in the other direction? Beyond tales of sailors and storms and a big fish? This is a story of a relentless God who used a broken prophet to bring salvation to the nations. The The Book Book of of Jonah. Jonah. All right, strap your seatbelts on and let's go. Secret Church in Jonah, one of the best known stories in all of the Bible. The problem is everybody knows the story because of a fish swallowing a man, which is sure to fascinate children and to capture our imaginations, but there are only three verses in the whole book that talk about a fish. And there's really not a lot of detail in those verses. And if we're not careful, our fascination with this fish can cause us to miss so much wonder in this book. Jonah is a masterpiece of literature that has inspired authors and painters and poets and musicians. And far from being some fairy tale about a fish, this is a real story with surprising relevance for our lives and the world we're living in right now. Now, if you've done Secret Church before, you'll notice that our our study guide here is pretty different. It's designed less around filling in blanks, although there are some of them, but it's designed more about you taking notes in the actual text of the Bible as we walk through it. So I want to encourage you to get a pen, pencil, and write. Take all kinds of notes as God speaks to you through his word. And I'm going to point out some things here on the screen in ways that I hope will help you. And one of my aims is that by the end of this time together, Not only will you know Jonah really well, but you'll have a resource full of notes on every word in this book of the Bible on your shelf that you can look back to in the future. And not just for you to have notes written on pages, but for you to have God's word imprinted on your heart in such a way that your life and the direction of it looks different as a result of what we're about to do. So, I invite you to open with me in your study guide to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to meditate on Scripture, which is what God calls us to do, not just to read it, but to meditate on it, to soak it in. I always use the illustration of when Heather, my wife, and I started dating in high school. She was the first girl who really ever paid any attention to me, and she would write me letters, and I would devour every word, like, get this letter, dear David. I think, dear, I think she likes me. And then she'd write a sentence and she'd put a smiley face. And I'd think, why a smiley face? Like right there after that sentence. And she'd tell me she's praying for me. And I'd think, huh, in what way? Is she praying for me like she prays for all kinds of people and I'm just one of them? Or is she praying for me like she prays for her future husband? Like I'm soaking in every single word and phrase to try to discern exactly what she is saying and thinking and feeling and meaning. And you might say that sounds pretty obsessive and I might agree with you because I was in love, but that's kind of the point. We love God and we love his word and we want to know what he's saying and thinking and feeling and meaning. We're obsessed. So we're going to explore his word like we love it, like It's a cave of supernatural treasure because it is. Psalm 119, 162 says, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. What a great verse. What a great word. Spoil. That's what we're about to do. We're just going to find, discover, and enjoy the spoil in the book of Jonah. And the author, 
And we're going to see, we don't actually know who wrote this book, but the author is a master of the Hebrew language. He uses different words and literary devices at different points to bring this story to life. And I'll point those places out along the way, but just know that as I do, my aim is not to impress you with my Hebrew. Uh, one, my Hebrew is very unimpressive. And two, I don't assume that even if my Hebrew was great, that would impress you. That's probably not at the top of the list of most impressive things in your mind. But when I point these things out, make notes so you can see some of the beauty of this book come through that doesn't come through automatically in the English translation. And then, as a side note, by the end of our time together, you're going to be able to impress others with some Hebrew. So, all right, enough setup. Let's go. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying. All right, let's, let's pause and ask some questions, make some observations on just this verse. First, like, who is writing this? Let's just ask that question. And as I mentioned a minute ago, we don't know. It could be Jonah, which would be a pretty humbling thing for him to do because, spoiler alert, the picture we get of Jonah is not that great in this book. So it could be a contrite, humbled Jonah who wants others to learn from his experience, or it could be somebody else. We don't know. And we don't know when it was written. So it's interesting how this book starts pretty abrupt abruptly without many important details that we see in other Bible books, and especially prophetic books. Think, for example, about the first verse in the book of Haggai, another prophet who wrote, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. That's a lot of detail. Like when? In the second year of Darius the king. In the sixth month on the first day of the month that's pretty precise then who the word of the lord came by the hand of haggai the prophet to zerubbabel who was the son of shealtiel who was governor of judah and to joshua the son of jehoshadak the high priest now here in jonah we don't have any of this we don't know when this happened we don't know where jonah is we're not even told that jonah was a prophet which we'll talk about more about in a second we just have this abrupt start now and the hebrew word here introduces a story almost like we might say once upon a time so immediately we're thrust into the story no setting instead we have a sudden word of the lord it's like the author of jonah is saying seemingly out of nowhere jonah got a word from god that he was not expecting that blindsided him. it came and we don't know how it came. Audible voice? Was it a vision? A dream? We don't know. But it came to Jonah. I mentioned a minute ago that Jonah is not called a prophet here or anywhere else in the book of Jonah for that matter. But we know he was a prophet for two reasons. One, because the word of the Lord came to him. That phrase, the word of the Lord came, appears over a hundred times in the Old Testament to introduce a message from God to a prophet. And seven times we're going to see it in this book. So maybe try to circle or underline it every time you see it. The mark of a prophet was that they received a word from God. And the other reason we know Jonah was a prophet is because there's one other mention of him in the Old Testament. So let's go outside the book of Jonah for a minute to understand what's happening inside the book of Jonah. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 14 where Jonah appears, and I've got this there in your study guide, follow along with me, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath -Huffer. Then it keeps going, for the Lord saw that the effect, affliction of Israel was very bitter, and there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. So he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Now, this passage definitely gives us some historical context. Jonah was 
a prophet from Gath Hefer, which was not far from Nazareth. And he was prophesying during the reign of Jeroboam. Jeroboam. That's what we learn in 2 Kings chapter 14. And just time-wise, that was about 782 to 753 BC. So you might write that down, 782 to 753. And that's important because, so that places Jonah as an 8th century prophet, which would make him a contemporary of guys like Amos and Hosea. Now think about that context, because 2 Kings 14 is telling us here, it was a time of much evil in the sight of the Lord. And I want you to make a note, and I want you to remember this Hebrew word for evil. Because when you transliterate it, in other words, you kind of put it into Hebrew, and then how does it sound in English? It sounds like ra. So I want you to circle evil there, and then make a note like R-A. Like ra. Maybe even say that with me. All right. Ra. All right. See, you're learning some Hebrew. And this is a word. It's fascinating. We're going to see it all throughout this journey as a dual meaning. It means evil or wickedness on one hand and calamity or trouble on the other hand, which go together, right? Like evil or wickedness against God brings calamity or trouble in our lives and in the world. And we're going to see in the book of Jonah why this word is so important. So just hold on to it for now. Evil, this word that sounds like Ra. Jeroboam was doing evil, Ra. He was sinning in the ways of his father. And he was leading Israel to sin. And you know what Amos and Hosea were doing? They were speaking out against Jeroboam. Look at some examples. Look at Hosea chapter 7, verse 3, where Hosea denounces King Jeroboam and the people. By their evil, they make the king glad, and the princes by their treachery. Hosea chapter 13, verses 10 and 11, God, through Hosea, calls Israel back to himself as king. Where now is your king to save you in all your cities? Where are all your rulers, those of whom you said, give me a king and princes? I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. Hosea is speaking directly against the king. And Amos does this all the more pointedly. Look at Amos chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. The Lord said, Behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. You know what happened once Amos, once Amos said that? Jeroboam heard about it? And his priest, Amaziah, came to Amos and said, look at Amos chapter 7, verse 12 through 13. Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it's a temple of the kingdom. Did you see that? Amos was just kicked out of Israel, forbidden from prophesying there. So that's what was going down between Jeroboam and Amos and Hosea, but not Jonah. Did you notice in what we read in 2 Kings 14? He got a different assignment. Look back there, starting back in verse 25 in 2 Kings 14, talking about Jeroboam, this evil king. The Bible says he restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel was very bitter. There was none left, bond or free. There was none to help Israel. But the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. So he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Did you catch that? So a little background here. For years, the nation of Assyria to the north had been threatening to overtake Israel. And the Israelites had a history of making a payments to Assyria because Israel was subordinate, even subservient to them. The Assyrians were powerful and they were vicious. They were known for their brutality and war. They wouldn't just overtake people, they would slaughter them. Assyrian records boast of live dismemberment, parades of heads, stretching prisoners with ropes and skinning them alive and then displaying their skin on the city walls and poles. One Assyrian king bragged about how he'd won a battle 
and killed over 3,000 men and captured others. And he wrote, Many of the captives I burned in a fire. Many I took alive. From some I cut off their hands to the wrist. From others I cut off their noses and ears and fingers. I put the eyes of many of the soldiers. I put out the eyes of many of the soldiers. I burnt their young men and women to death. And then those who lived were cruelly enslaved. Listen to how Nahum chapter 2 verse 13 describes the Assyrians. The lion tore enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lionesses. He filled his caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. The Assyrians were brutal and powerful. Not a good combo. But just before Jeroboam became king, Assyria started to weaken. Then when Jeroboam became king, God gave a word to Jonah to go and deliver to the king, likely in the court in Samaria, the capital of, the, uh, of, of Israel. He gave him the word of the Lord. There's that phrase back here in 2 Kings chapter 14. And the word was, that came through Jonah, Israel is going to retake cities and Israel's borders are going to expand because God sees and loves Israel. So Jonah spoke this word, and then it happened. What Jonah said came true. Israel's borders expanded, which made Jonah a what? He was a hero, a national hero. Forget Amos over there prophesying against Israel. Keep him quiet. We want Jonah. We want to hear what Jonah has to say. Just imagine this. Certainly, for those of us who live in the U.S., this is also true, though, in countries around the world. National borders are a pretty hot-button issue. And any prophet in a nation who says, our borders are going to expand, and then it happens, you're the man. Jonah was the face of national prosperity and pride for Israel. So now, with all of that information, now we come back to Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, and we have a whole new perspective on this first verse. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, if you're an Israelite hearing this story, you're thinking, yes, we love it when God's word comes to Jonah. You rise up with national pride at just the thought. And then, okay, one more thing about this first verse. It so clearly and succinctly sets the stage for a book about two main characters, the Lord, I'm going to just circle him, and Jonah, the prophet. This is a book about who the Lord, God, really is. And this is a book that reveals who Jonah, the prophet, really is as a representative of the people of Israel. And when you put all this together, this verse, first verse, may not contain a lot of details, but it sets the stage powerfully for the next verse to shock us. So what did God say to Jonah, the son of Amittai, the Israelite hero? He said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Feel the force of this verse. So there's three imperative verbs, which are commands. Arise, go, and call. So the word for arise literally means get up. It carries a sense of urgency. Get up now and go. Which is how God often speaks to prophets. He's sending. Like the same exact words appear in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 9, when God speaks to Elijah and he says, The word of the Lord came to him, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. So what did Elijah do? He arose and he went to Zarephath. Same thing in Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 6 and 7. After many days, the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the loincloth that I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates. So this is normal language from God to a prophet. With urgency, get up and go. But the next two words are not normal in any way. Arise and go to Nineveh. And we need to feel what Jonah felt, what the audience would have felt as soon as those words came from God's mouth. Like, get up and go to Nineveh. There's at least two 
shockingly abnormal things about this command. One, Nineveh is in a foreign nation. It's outside of Israel, making this command unprecedented in Old Testament prophecy up to this point. It was normal for a prophet to speak about a foreign nation. Many prophets declared God's judgment against foreign nations, and that prophecy would usually serve either to comfort God's people by reminding them that these nations would one day be judged, or that prophecy would serve as a warning to God's people so they wouldn't make an alliance with those nations in light of their judgment to come. And God would lovingly use this prophecy to keep his people from disaster. But this is different. This is not God giving a word to Jonah about a foreign nation. This is God telling Jonah to go to a foreign nation. This is God telling the prophet associated with Israel's borders to cross those borders. And the implication is just as God sends prophets to the people of Israel to comfort or warn them to keep them from judgment, God is sending his prophet to another nation to either comfort or warn them and keep them from judgment. Which leads to all kinds of questions because we know that God loves the people of Israel in the Old Testament. But does God love all the nations in such a way that he would send his prophets to them? So that's the first thing that's shocking here. God calling a Jewish prophet to go to another nation with a message of comfort or warning to keep them from judgment. And then the shock goes to a whole other level when you realize which foreign nation God is calling Jonah to go to. The people of Nineveh, that great city. And the word for great there, which we'll see many times in the book, means significant, large, prestigious, important, even valuable. And it's a city that we actually see all the way back in the beginning of the Bible. Genesis 10 tells us the history of nations descended from Noah and his family. And listen, starting in verse 8. Cush fathered Nimron. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it's said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna, and the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh. What? Did you hear that? And Nineveh, Nineveh was the first city upon which foreign nation was founded. Assyria. Like cruel, vicious, brutal, powerful Assyria. The vile enemies of Israel. God says, Jonah, get up and go to the heart of Assyria, to Nineveh. And just so you know how much disdain the people of Israel had for Nineveh, we'll talk about uh, Nahum later, which is an entire book of the Bible devoted to the evil of Nineveh, to the point where in the early church, Nineveh was regarded as a symbol of the devil himself. And no Israelite was neutral when they heard the word Nineveh. So just imagine being Jonah or any other Israelite. You want to stay as far away from Nineveh and Assyria as possible. Even the mention of this city, this nation, incites terror in you. And the last thing you want to do for this wicked, evil people that, by the way, is waning in power, is to give them a message of comfort or warning that might keep them from judgment. Especially if you're the prophet that represents pride in Israel. You want this terrorizing nation to experience total destruction. Which leads to the third command in this verse. God says, call out against it. Nineveh, this great city, for their evil. Guess what Hebrew word that is? You've already learned it. So say it. Ra. Might make a note there. Same word, Ra, that we saw in 2 Kings 14 to describe the evil and calamity of Israel during the reign of King Jeroboam. Now, this word is describing the evil and calamity of the people of Nineveh, the Assyrians. And the point is clear. Make the connection. When God saw evil and calamity in Israel in 2 Kings 14, what did he do? God lovingly spoke to them through his prophet Jonah. Now, when God sees evil and calamity among the Assyrians, what's he doing? God is lovingly sending to them his prophet Jonah. This phrase, their evil has come up before me, literally means it's a cause of concern for me, which leads us to tension surrounding what God is saying here. And we've got to feel it. 
Put yourself in Jonah's shoes. You're the prophet of national Israelite pride, and God is telling you to get up and go to your enemies, the people who have brutally terrorized your nation and other nations, and tell them God's word, knowing God's word may lead them to repent and might keep them from destruction. So to go in and do this would, well, first of all, be risking your life to go to the dangerous inner city of Nineveh, the heart of Assyria as an Israelite. Israelites don't go there. And then if you live long enough to speak this word, once they hear you, then they could kill you, just like Israelites did with prophets who said things they didn't like. Or what if they actually listen and they turn to God and as a result, they rebound in their prosperity? Then what are you going to say when you come back to Israel? You just saved the enemy. You'll no longer be a national hero. You may not even be allowed back in Israel. This is called being stuck between a rock and a hard place. Now, here's the deal. I want to be careful because we're starting to get into conjecture about what Jonah is thinking. And we're about to read what Jonah decided to do at the beginning of verse three. But I wanna point out here that between the end of verse two and the beginning of verse three, the author intentionally does not tell us what Jonah was thinking or how he made his decision. We're gonna to have to wait until chapter four to find out Jonah was what Jonah was really thinking. And the author is intentionally leaving that piece of information out at this point to keep us in suspense, knowing that God's word has just introduced major tension into the story. So what does Jonah do? Verse three, but never a good word to see right after God has given a command, but Jonah rose, rose. That's the same word that God told Jonah to do at the beginning of verse two, arise, get up. Jonah got up. All right. He rose to flee. We're expecting to see Jonah do what other prophets throughout the Old Testament do. Look at Amos chapter 3, verse 8. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? God is a lion. When he speaks, you do what he says. But not Jonah. Jonah rises and runs. And this verse is fascinating. Just look for words and phrases that repeat as you read through it. He rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Do you see the repetition? At two times we see the phrase, from the presence of the Lord. From the presence of the Lord. He's fleeing away from God. That's the exact opposite of what we see in other prophets. God's word came to Elijah and he went. God's word came to Jeremiah and he went. God's word came to Jonah and he fled. And look at another phrase that's repeated twice. Twice, Jonah went down to Joppa and found a ship. He paid the fare and he went down into the ship. The author is describing a downward journey. In contrast, God, who is what? Look back in verse two, he's up. None of us evil has come up before me. So circle down here in verse three. We're going to see that a few more times in this chapter. Then one more picture of repetition in verse three. Three times we see Tarshish mentioned. He fled to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish. Three times. Why does he mention it three times in one verse? Well, look at the geography. I want to show you a map here behind this verse. It'll help us to understand it. Jonah receives this word from God in Israel. And remember, Assyria is to the east, northeast of Israel. And Nineveh is specifically east, northeast of where Jonah is. So God says, go to the city that's east, northeast of you. And Jonah goes down both physically and spiritually, to Joppa, a Mediterranean port city that's actually near Jerusalem, where he can find a boat that'll help him get to Tarshish. And whereas Nineveh was east, northeast of Jonah, Tarshish was the furthest known western place in the Mediterranean world. Based on 2 Chronicles 8, 921, it's estimated that the sail to Tarshish would take about a year or even 18 months. In other words, Jonah was literally, physically, and spiritually going as far away from God 
and God's call on his life as he could possibly get. And it was costly. He paid the fare to do this. It was likely a whole lot of money, but Jonah clearly believed it was worth it. In fact, look with me at the description of Tarshish in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 19. Look at this. God says, From them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Paul, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands far away that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. That's how Tarshish is described. Jonah wants to go to a place so far away where people haven't heard or seen about God and him revealed his word. Why? Because Jonah doesn't want in his own life at this point to hear God or see God. He wants totally away from God's presence. And the question is why? But what is it in God's word to Jonah in verse 3 that made him respond so drastically in disobedience? Is it because he's afraid of what could happen to him in Nineveh? Is it because he's afraid of what could happen to his reputation in Israel? Or is there something deeper here? And we don't know yet. All we know is that Jonah has decided to give up on God. But God has not given up on Jonah. Verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. There was a mighty tempest on the sea, so the ship threatened to break it up. So, but the same word that starts verse 3 starts 4. As things again go in a direction we might not expect because, well, just think about it. How the story could, or maybe should, go at this point. Jonah was not the only prophet that God could call on here. There were many other prophets in that day, which means that at this point, God could have let Jonah sail off into the sunset, never to be seen again. God easily could have raised up another prophet to go to Nineveh. But God didn't do that. And in the coming verses, I want us to think about why God didn't do that. We've been talking about Jonah's motives in this picture. Let's also think about God's motives in this picture. Why is God doing what he's doing? And it's interesting, here in verse 3, Hebrew word order usually puts a verb before the subject instead of like in English, we put the verb after the subject. But here in verse 4, the Hebrew does something out of the ordinary and puts the language just like you see here in English. But the Lord puts the subject first, emphasizing how God took the initiative here. The Lord hurled. So God threw. You might circle that word. We're going to see it three more times in this chapter. God hurled or threw a great wind upon the sea. That word great, we've already seen in the previous verses to describe Nineveh. So you might circle it there. Again, we're going to see it many times. Uh, I think 11 more times in this book total. So a great wind, this gale force wind hurled by God that causes a mighty tempest on the sea. It's so interesting. When you read the Hebrew here, the Words the author uses actually sound like waves crashing against the side of a sh ship. It sounds like hishabala, hishabar, like in such a way that the ship threatened to break up. This is personification of the ship. It's using language that would normally be used of a person, like the ship is it's thinking about, it's threatening to tear apart. And the irony is pretty thick here. Jonah is trying to use a ship and sea and wind to run away, and it's like the ship and the sea and the wind are conspiring together under God's direction to keep Jonah from running away. But it's not just affecting Jonah. Verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. So now, for the first time, we have more characters in the story. The mariners, sailors, experts at sea, and they were afraid. So circle that word, because it'll be important as we keep going through this trap chapter. They were afraid. Which is saying something, because surely these guys had seen bad weather before. But this was unusually bad. We might say supernaturally bad. So what did they do? Each cried out to his God. These sailors were likely from different nations. They believed in different gods. And obviously they attributed this storm to one of those gods. So they're thinking they've offended some god in some way. So they start crying out to all their gods to cover their bases. And at the same time, they hurl. Same word that's used earlier about what God did and hurling the wind upon the sea, here they hurl the cargo in order to lighten the load. So you have this scene of prayer and panic and fear on the deck of the ship. But 
chapter 1, verse 5. Again, total contrast, introducing something surprising to see. But Jonah had gone down. That's the third time now we've seen this phrase. He's going down twice in verse 3 now, again in verse 5, signifying not just a downward journey physically, but also spiritually. And we know this because this next phrase, into the inner part of the ship, inner part there is a word that's used in other parts of the Old Testament to describe descending into death or Sheol, the abode of the dead. Look at Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15. It says, but you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. That's the same language that's used here to describe how Jonah has gone down to a dark place. So there's a physical dynamic at work here. Jonah, the disobedient prophet, is exhausted, maybe even depressed. Like, think about it. His career as a prophet is over. He's exiling himself from his home and his country. He's at a low point. He just wants to get away from everything. And at the same time, on a spiritual level, he's at a low point. He's descending towards spiritual death. Then look at this next phrase. He laid, had laid down and was fast asleep. And this language of sleep like this is used at other points in the Bible to describe when someone falls into a deep slumber right before a significant encounter with God. Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then God spoke to Abram. Or Daniel chapter 8, verse 18. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. Then God spoke to Daniel through an angel. So the stage is set here for Jonah to wake up and encounter God. And watch what happens. Verse 6. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean? You're, you sleeper? Translation, like, what is wrong with you, bro? What are you doing? And then watch this. The captain says, arise, call out to your God. Do you recognize that language? Arise. Get up. That's the first word that God spoke to Jonah back in verse 2. Arise, get up, and call out. Which is also the same word God spoke to Jonah in verse 2. Get up and call out to Nineveh. So just imagine what's going through Jonah's mind at this point as he wakes up and he literally cannot get away from the words of God. Now they're just coming through this uh, mariner sea captain. And the irony goes even deeper because now you have a pagan ship captain from a foreign nation telling Jonah, the prophet from Israel, he needs to pray. And perhaps that God will give a thought to us that we may not perish the captain of the ship, the expert on the ship, realizes this storm is so bad that they're in danger of perishing, of dying, and he's desperate for divine help. Do you see the irony? The prophet from Israel is running from God. This pagan ship captain from another nation is doing anything he can to seek God. And it's not just him. Back to the mariners in verse 7. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So lots were pretty commonly used in that day for decision making, including in the Bible. And they were discerning a replacement for Judas. In Acts chapter 1, verse 24 says, they prayed and said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33 says, The lot is cast in the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And we're not completely sure how this worked, but lots were probably a lot like dice, with different sides and colors that you would cast to discern between multiple options, and God's people would use lots to determine God's direction. So these sailors decide to cast lots, so they can know on whose account this what has come evil. Guess what Hebrew word that is? There it is again. Ra, evil or calamity. Who's responsible for this calamity that has come upon us? So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. I picture the scene as all these sailors, the captain and Jonah, they're gathered around in a circle in the middle of a raging storm. They cast a lot and this guy's okay, and that guy's okay, and this guy's okay, and that guy's okay. Then the lot falls on Jonah, and everybody stops and stares at him. 
and immediately they pepper him with questions. They said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. Again, Ra, evil, on whose account are we experiencing this calamity? Remember the dual meaning. Who has done evil to cause this calamity? Who's offended the God who's responsible for this storm? And in that day, pagan people associated gods with different aspects of a person's life. You'd have a God associated with your trade or occupation or your city or your nation or your family or your clan. So they ask, where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? They want to know what God is at work in this storm. And Jonah's response is enlightening to say the least. And he said to them, keep in mind, this is the first time that Jonah actually speaks in the whole story. Up to this point, Jonah hasn't said a word that we've read. So what are his first words? I am a Hebrew. He identifies himself with a common term that Israelites would use that introduced themselves to foreigners. And it's pretty interesting, isn't it? That the first words to come out of Jonah's mouth, out of the mouth of the prophet associated with nationalistic pride are, I am a Hebrew. This is who I am, my identity. And then he continues, and I fear the Lord. That's interesting. Don't you think? Like, does he? Circle that word fear that you've already circled once with the mariners. We're, we'll come back to it. Jonah says, I fear the Lord. And if you'll notice there in the Bible, whenever you see capital L, small caps O-R-D in your Bible, you know that's the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh, the covenant name that God revealed himself with to Moses and to God's people, Israel. This name represents God's special relationship with Israel. And Jonah elaborates, the Lord is the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah's saying, I know the Lord who's in control of all of this, the heavens and the sea and the land. And immediately, verse 10, then the men were exceedingly afraid. Circle it again, afraid, fear. The language itself actually repeats itself. It's literally the men feared with a great fear when they heard who the Lord is, which makes you wonder who's really showing true fear in this story. Specifically, fear of the Lord. Jonah's saying he fears God, but the sailors sure seem like the ones who fear God. And they said to him, what is this that you have done? Notice it's an exclamation, not a question. You know what? What's interesting is, you know the first time we see this language in the Bible? Genesis chapter 3, the third chapter in the Bible, right after Adam and Eve commit the first sin ever in the world. We read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? Just as God knew what Adam and Eve had done, these sailors knew Jonah had done something seriously wrong that wasn't just affecting him, it was affecting them. Then Jonah chapter 1 verse 10 fills in some detail about some dialogue they had. For the men knew he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Same language we read in verse 3. He was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? So that for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Like the urgency of the situation is rising as the sea gets more and more tempestuous. The language is symbolic of the reality that the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land is not giving up on Jonah. And the sailors are wondering what to do with him. But Jonah's reply is far more than the, what they were thinking. He said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. And what a response. Pick me up and hurl me. And I'd circle that word. We've seen it twice already. The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, verse 4. They hurled the cargo into the sea, verse 5. Now Jonah says, hurl me into the sea. Now obviously Jonah knows it's because of him that this is happening. But why this solution? Like, think of other potential solutions. Like one, he could repent. He could fall on his knees and say, I'm sorry, God, I should have obeyed you. Please spare these sailors and me. Or he could have said to these guys, I'm running from God. The way to stop the storm is for us to turn around and me to go back. As we're about to see in the next verse, that's the solution the sailors were thinking about. So why does Jonah say, I need to die? Like, think about this. This means one of two things, or maybe both. One, Maybe Jonah thinks God wants him dead. Then repentance wouldn't be enough or obedience now wouldn't be enough. 
Maybe Jonah thinks he's so far under the judgment of God that death is the only option for him now. Or two, maybe Jonah would rather die than obey God. And one clue we have that this might be what's going through Jonah's mind is that we're going to see him talk again like this, like he wants to die. But we haven't gotten there yet, so we're again wondering about a question for which we don't yet have an answer. Why is Jonah so against God and proclaiming God's word in Nineveh? Why would death be preferable for Jonah over obedience to God and going to Nineveh? So back to the text, verse 13. It says, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. So Jonah had just taught the sailors how they could live by throwing Jonah overboard. They don't want to do it. They want Jonah to live more than Jonah wants to live. So they start rowing hard, but to no avail. Again, the text says the sea grew more and more tempestuous, just like we've seen, which leads to verse 14. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay out on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Wow. These sailors are now calling out to the Lord. Like they're doing what the prophet of Yahweh, the Lord, is not doing. Jonah's refusing to call out to God, but they are. This is the only prayer like this from pagan polytheists in the Bible. This is humiliating for a Jewish person to even read. Pagan Gentiles are doing what the Israelite prophet won't do. They're praying to, they're believing in the covenant God of Israel. The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land, which is pretty different from where they started. They were each praying to his own God, right? It's interesting, this last phrase, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. That phrase is used three other times in scripture. And every time this phrase is mentioned, it specifically refers to how false gods and idols are worthless and only the Lord, the one true God, hears and answers prayer. Look at him, Psalm 115, verse three through eight. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases, the idols, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Then Psalm chapter 135, verses 5 through 7. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and on earth, and seas and all the deeps, he it is who makes the clouds. Rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. Then one more, Isaiah chapter 46. Remember this and stand firm or call to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I shall accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of counsel from a far country. I have spoken, I will bring it to pass, I have purposed and I will do it according to what you please. So now here in Jonah chapter 1, verses 14, verse 14, we have sailors turning aside from praying to false gods, seeking the one true God, the Lord, knowing his purpose will be accomplished, which actually frightens them because they don't want to be found guilty for killing Jonah by throwing him overboard, which actually leads to another question. Why didn't Jonah just throw himself overboard? Jonah's putting that responsibility on them and they're afraid they're going to die if they kill a prophet of the Lord. But at this point, things are desperate. They've tried everything they could. So they look to God, trusting in God, what his prophet has said to do. And then verse 15 tells us. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him. Circle it again. It is the fourth time we've seen this word hurled. They hurled him into the sea. Just pause there. Put yourself, well, in different shoes. Put yourself in Jonah's shoes as these sailors pick you up, hold you over a raging sea, you think you are going to your death for sure. You are realizing what disobedience to God looks like, a watery grave. You thought you were running to a great, exotic, distant land, when in reality you are running to your death. This is where disobedience leads. And then put yourself in the shoes of these sailors who are hurling him overboard, hoping that you're doing the right thing as you throw this man to his death. And watch this, as soon as they did, the sea ceased from its raging. That word raging is used throughout the Old Testament to refer to anger. And the picture is clear. The judgment of God has been accomplished and now everything is quiet. And now keep yourself in these sailor's shoes. Can you imagine the awe they experienced when as soon as they threw this man overboard, the wind and the waves got quiet and they knew 
it was true. Yahweh, the Lord, is the God of heaven who rules the sea and dry land. And they just had a personal encounter with him. So verse 16 makes total sense. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. This is a fascinating verse that uses repetition in the Hebrew that we don't usually don't really feel or get in English. Like the text literally says the men feared the Lord with great fear. And you circle again, fear there, because you think about the progression of fear we've seen in these sailors. In verse 5, they were afraid of the storm. In verse 10, they were afraid because they realized Jonah had disobeyed God. Now in verse 16, it all comes full circle as they fear the Lord huh. with great fear, exceedingly. It reminds us of Mark 4, doesn't it? The disciples on a boat, when a great windstorm arises, Jesus is asleep on the boat. They wake him up. He calms the wind and the waves. And what does Mark chapter 4, verse 44, 41 say? They were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The sailors in Jonah 1 and the disciples in Mark 4 were filled with great fear because they realized they were in the presence of the Lord, the God of heaven who rules the sea, and they were in awe of him, which leads them to make offer a sacrifice to the Lord. The language there is also repetitive. It's literally they sacrifice sacrifices to Yahweh. Then they made vows. In the original languages, they vowed vows. The author is using the Hebrew language to make a point. Even if or when God's prophet in Israel refuses to proclaim his word among the nations, God will still draw foreign nations to himself. Isn't it ironic? Jonah is acting like the anti-missionary here. But even as he does, God is still using Jonah to draw the nations to worship him. And make sure you catch the scene as chapter 1 comes to a close. On one hand, you have a shockingly disobedient Israelite. On the other hand, you have surprisingly transformed Gentiles. Let me say that again. Stow this away in your mind. At the end of chapter 1, you have a shockingly disobedient Israelite and surprisingly transformed Gentiles. And in this, see what sure seems to be like a major theme developing in the book of Jonah, the resistance of God's people to the spread of God's worship among the nations. So we'll stop here for this section, knowing, so yes, there is still one more verse in chapter 1, but there's actually disagreement over whether verse 17 in chapter 1 and the original is actually verse 1 of chapter 2, but regardless, Remember that chapter divisions are not a part of the original text, and this scene is about to make a major shift. So before it does, I want to help us soak in what we've read with just a few takeaways. And we'll cover these pretty quick because we've already seen all of them in the text. So first, what we learn about God. From the opening words of this book, we learn that God's word is authoritative. The story starts with the word of the Lord to Jonah, and everything that happens after that revolves around Jonah's response to that word. God's word is authoritative. And everything in your life, and my life, and in the world hinges on how we respond to it, which makes what we're doing together right now all the more significant, right? We need to know and study, to meditate on and memorize, to hear and heed the word of the Lord in our lives. And your life and my life hinges on this. God's word is authoritative and his sovereignty is absolute. The Lord is the God of heaven who made and who rules the sea and the dry land. Like wind doesn't just happen. God hurls it. Waves don't just happen. God brings them. We do not live in a world governed by natural causes. We live in a world governed by a supernatural creator. In the words of Psalm 147, he covers the heaven with heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down crystals of ice like crumbs who can stand before his cold he sends out his word and melts them he makes his wind blow and the waters flow god is sovereign over all nature the rain falls the wind blows at his bidding which leads to the third truth we learn about god his wrath is real we see this from the start as god speaks about the evil among the ninevites and the picture is clear sin anywhere in any nation is an offense against god and he will judge it similarly the storm in Jonah 1 is a picture of God's judgment. Think about the language we saw in Jonah 1. A great wind, a mighty tempest that grew more and more tempestuous multiple times. A sea raging. The wrath of God towards sin and sinful people is real. At the same time, God's mercy is relentless. 
Again, from the start, as God calls a prophet to lovingly bring his word to evil Ninevites. And then, as we said, God could have let Jonah go off in his disobedience into death, but he doesn't. God is pursuing Jonah, and not just Jonah. God's pursuing pagan sailors who are worshiping false gods. God's revealing himself to them. Though this storm may seem severe, even this picture of his judgment is a demonstration of his mercy. Mark that down. Sometimes even God's mercy may seem severe in our lives as sinners, which leads to what we learn about us. It's clear from verse 3 of this prophetic book, this book about a prophet, that we are all inclined to rebel against God. It's going to be easy throughout this journey to look down on Jonah at different points. But before we look down on him, we need to look into ourselves. Have you ever run from God's word in your life? Have you ever run from proclaiming God's word in somebody else's life? And we're all guilty here. We are all prone to flee from the presence of God and the call of God in our lives. Years ago, Abraham Kuyper, a Reformed theologian, one-time prime minister of the Netherlands, said, Our heart is continually inclined to rebel against the Lord our God, so ready to rebel that, oh, so gladly, were it but for a single day, we would take from his hands the reins of his supreme rule, imagining that we would manage things far better and direct them far more effectively than God. We all run from God's word in our lives for many different reasons and motivations. And maybe that's part of the reason why we don't yet know Jonah's motivation behind his disobedience. Maybe the human author here, and all the more so the divine author, is wanting us to consider why do you or I run from God's word in our lives? Is it because we don't trust God? Is it because we think we know better than God? Is, is it because we prefer our ways over God's ways? Is it because it might cost us if we obey? Is it because we just don't like God's word and we want to get as far away from it as we can? Like, let's see ourselves in Jonah and ask the question, how and why do we run from God's word in our lives? Why is it that just like in this story, all creation responds to the bidding of God, the wind, the wind, the waves, the rain. But when you get to you and me, we have the audacity to look God in the face and say, no. Not only do we run from God's word in our lives, we run from proclaiming God's word in others' lives. God has commissioned every follower of Jesus to be a witness to others about Jesus. But do you ever run from that commission? Have you or I ever stayed silent when we've had an opportunity to share the gospel? If so, then what's the difference between us and Jonah? The effect was the same, right? God's word wasn't shared. If you've ever been to Secret Church before or been exposed to any radical resources or heard me speak or open your eyes to the world, you would know that there are over 3.2 billion people in the world right now who have yet to be reached by the gospel. It's not that they've heard God's word and they've rejected it. It's they've never even heard it. But how is that possible? With all the resources and travel and technology we have available to us today, are the unreached in the world not a glaring indictment of how we have run from proclaiming God's word in others' lives? Jesus has given us a clear word. Arise, go, make disciples of all the nations. Get up, go to all the nations, all the ethne, all the people groups of the world. Warn them of coming judgment. Tell them about God's mercy. So who are we to sit back in judgment of Jonah for not going to one people group when we're living in a time where over 7,000 people groups are still unreached by the gospel and Jesus has told us to go to them. And again, as we, as we wonder about Jonah's motivation, let's contemplate our own motivation. Why are we not reaching the unreached with the gospel? What is keeping us from obeying God's command? What? Why are you and I running from proclaiming God's word in others' lives? Right around us? All around the world, we are all inclined to rebel against God's word in our lives and proclaiming God's word in others' lives. And our sin inevitably leads us on a downward path toward death. This is clear in the language of Jonah. He goes down, he goes down, he goes down. Sin does not take you up. Sin takes you down toward death. And look at what has happened to Jonah as a result of his sin. He doesn't even want to live. See how disorienting it deceiving and dangerous sin is sin takes us to dark places like make the connection with our lives as long as you and i run from god's word in our lives and run from claiming god's word in others lives we will live disoriented deceived and ultimately dark lives our sin inevitably takes us on a downward path toward death and speaking of being disoriented and deceived Consider these last two takeaways from Jonah 1 about us. One, it is possible for us to ground our identity in how the world defines us instead of how God's word defines us. As soon as the lot is cast 
upon Jonah, the sailors ask five successive questions that basically revolve around one question. Who are you? And the first words out of Jonah's mouth are, I am a Hebrew. Jonah points them to the fundamental position in his life for which he was most proud. He was an Israelite through and through. That's who he was. And sure, Jonah was a Hebrew, but just ask the question, is that how God would have fundamentally defined Jonah? And as you think about that question, think about your life. Is it possible for you or me to see ourselves with labels in this world, whether, whether they're chosen by us or given to us as our fundamental identity over and above what God says about us in his word? How are you prone to identify yourself in this world? Are you an American? Are you a Christian American or an American Christian? What is primary, not just in the language you use, but in the priorities you live by? Who are you? What is your identity? And how does that affect the way you live and the choices you make and the values you prioritize? We'll come back to that one later. For now, the last takeaway about us, it is possible for us to have a kind of faith in God without having true fear of God. Isn't that Jonah? He believes in God. He has a faith in God. And he says he fears God. But the contrast with the sailors in Jonah 1 is making clear. Jonah does not seem to have true fear of God. So is that possible for you? Is it possible for you or me to have a kind of faith in God that lacks true fear of God? When you think about it, Jonah's faith, in a sense, doesn't waver throughout this chapter. He believes in God. He knows God exists. Jonah just doesn't want to have anything to do with God. Jonah has a kind of faith in God that lacks fear of God, which leads to the question, do you fear God? And right where you're sitting right now, do you revere God? Is the fear of God evident in your life? On a daily basis, does the fear and awe and reverence and worship of your life look more like these sailors or more like Jonah? Which leads to the last part of these takeaways, what we learn about the world. One, God will draw the nations to know and worship him. We mentioned at the end of the chapter, even in Jonah's disobedience to God's command to go to a foreign nation, God is using Jonah to lead sailors from foreign nations to himself. And while we haven't read it yet, God's word is eventually going to go to Nineveh. This is a truth we see from cover to cover in scripture. It's encapsulated in a verse like Psalm 146, or Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You just turn the pages of the Bible to the end and you see where it's all going. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this, I looked in a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What God is doing in Jonah is what God is doing in history. He is drawing and he will ultimately draw people from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages to know and worship him. But what we're seeing in the book of Jonah is that God is not just intent on the accomplishment of his purpose. He is also intent on the hearts of his people. If God was just focused on the nations, specifically Nineveh and the Assyrians, then like we said, God could have gotten easily another prophet to do this job, but God didn't. And why not? Because God is also focused on Jonah's heart. In other words, God was not just concerned about Nineveh. God was concerned about Jonah. And I want you to let that soak in wherever you are right now. Yes, there are eight plus billion people in the world and over three billion of them are unreached by the gospel. And God is intent on every single nation, tribe, tongue, and people knowing and worshiping him. At the same time, God is also intent on your heart. Right where you are right now, God is intent on your heart. The same God who hurled the wind in Jonah 1 is the same God who is at work in your life. He's the same God who is speaking to you right now. So will you listen to him? And how will you respond to him. So that wraps up Jonah chapter one and leads us right into our first video about Iran. You know what's interesting? Nineveh is modern day Mosul in northern Iraq, meaning it's right next to Iran. 
So let's learn some about the history of Iran that leads to persecution there today. And as we do, let's ask God to do whatever he wants to do in our hearts for the accomplishment of his purposes among the nations. Watch this with me. It's April 1951. The World Wrestling Championships are being held in Helsinki, Finland, and this is a year that one of the greatest Persian athletes won Iran's first international medal, the silver, in wrestling. His name was Golamreza Takti, and he was just getting started. One year later, he went to the Summer Olympics in Melbourne, where he finally brought home the gold. Takti's career in wrestling took him all over the world, winning medal after medal. This guy was a national icon, one of the most beloved figures in Iran's history. I mean, they made a movie about him. But he was loved not just because of his athletic feats, but also because of the kind of guy he was. He was honorable and fair in his wrestling matches. He once found out an opponent was injured in one leg, so he intentionally avoided it and only attacked the other. When he beat the reigning champ of the world in Moscow, he noticed his opponent's mother was crying, so he pulled her aside and comforted her. And when an earthquake devastated Buin Sara in 1961, Takti walked the streets calling on everyone, especially other prominent Iranians, to provide help and relief. He was in many ways a man of the people. But why does all of this matter? A few months ago, I was in Tehran, the capital city of Iran, and I first learned about Takti when I visited his grave with a local guide. His unexpected and controversial death caused a stir in the nation, and thousands showed up to his funeral. It was clear that the man buried in this tomb was different from the others. It looked like a tomb for a king, or a shah, as they're known in Persia. And back in the 60s, Iran was ruled by the shah, but unlike Takti, the Shah and his regime was not as beloved or praised by the public. Across a backdrop of political corruption, economic strife, and natural disasters, people had very little faith in their leadership. They lived in fear and distress, but they couldn't complain out of fear of being harassed, arrested, or even killed by the Shah's secret police. The contrast between a leader like Takti and the Shah couldn't be clearer. While we were at Takti's grave, my guide, a devout Muslim, told me story after story of the hardships and discontentment of living under the Shah. But it's what he said at the end of his stories that stood out to me the most. Living under the Shah was terrible, but life today under the Islamic regime is a hundred times worse. My name is Steven Morales. I'm part of the team here at Radical. For the past year, we've been documenting stories of God's work around the world and what that has to do with us in a series we call Neighborhoods and Nations. I want to take you on a journey through the history of one of the oldest civilizations on the planet, tracing back thousands of years to understand the complexities and ruptures and fractures of a nation, and how that has led to cultural and religious challenges that make Iran such a hard to reach place that is bursting with opportunity for gospel growth today. The truth is, if you're a part of Western Christianity and watching this, You've probably only seen Iran through the limited lens of news headlines or Hollywood movies. It's possible that, like me, you've never actually considered going or sending or supporting indigenous churches in a place that just seems like another Nineveh. But if God's heart is to reach all nations, then we have to ask ourselves, how did some of these nations, nations like Iran, become so hard to reach? And is it possible that God could bring a revival to cities in Iran like Tehran, Isfahan, and Shiraz, just like he did to Nineveh? This is hard to reach Iran. So let's go back to the 1960s. Iran is being ruled by Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. Since the time of the Medes, yeah, like the ones you read about in Daniel and Isaiah, Iran has been ruled by Shahs. And Pahlavi was the last of those Shahs. And he was allegedly trying to make Iran a secular country. He came to power after World War II with promises of freedom and growth and modernity for Iran like never before. 
And while things seemed to be going in that direction, Pahlavi was not the ruler the people of Iran hoped for. His life was marked by excess, throwing lavish parties and living a life of luxury while his people starved and struggled through a national economic crisis. This was nothing new for the Pahlavi dynasty or even for the dynasties that ruled before, like the Qajar dynasty, which started all the way back in 1789. Iran has had a long history of unjust rulers, revolutions, and changing of powers. In order to understand why this is relevant for us today, we need to look back even further back to before Iran was even called Iran. That's right, Persia. It's not every day you can trace the history of a country back to the Bible, but flip open the Old Testament and you'll find a lot about the Persian Empire. We hear about Persian rulers in places like Second Chronicles, Ezra, and Ezekiel. But you probably know it best from this story. Oh no, what we gonna do? The king likes Daniel more than me. Surely your God is above all men. Now I understand. For even at the bottom of the lion's den, you were in his hand. Daniel and the lions within Darius the Mede. All of this is happening during what is called the Achaemenid dynasty, one of the greatest empires the world has ever scene, and it all happened right here in Iran. The story literally ends saying, so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian, who's also known as Cyrus the Great. Cyrus was the leader that Isaiah prophesied about in Isaiah 45, saying he would bring Israel back from exile. Cyrus was the founder of the first great Persian empire that extended over the southeast of Europe and Egypt and into parts of India. His grandson, Xerxes, was also an important Bible figure. You might remember him with another name. Now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him. This is the beginning of the Book of Esther, and it's also happening in present day Iran. So 2,500 years ago, Persia was a powerful empire that ruled over, man, almost half the population on Earth. And it seemed like for a moment there, Persia was poised to rule the world. And then history took a turn that no man could have foreseen. A group of tribes that had historically been dispersed and at odds with each other united under one man and one creed and began expanding into Iran. Arab forces made their first incursion onto Iranian soil right after the death of Muhammad in 633 AD. At this point, the Persian Empire had worn itself out from internal civil war while defending its grounds from the Romans and now found itself fighting off a Muslim army. They pressed on and continued to fight for almost two decades, but this new Islamic threat would ultimately prove the demise of the Neo-Persian Empire. And so, Islam entered Iran. Now we can't cover a whole religion in one video, but for the sake of this story, there's some things you should know. Islam is an Arabic word that literally means submitting. Muslim means one who submits to God. You may have heard the Islamic creed, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Their holy book is called the Quran, which should only be read and studied in Arabic. There are two major denominations in Islam, Sunni and Shia. Across the world, Sunnis make up the majority, but the most well-known exception is in Iran. The split between these two denominations happened in the first generation of Islam in the seventh century, and the breaking point was about who should be Muhammad's successor. Today, there are a number of theological and practical differences between the two, but they do share some common beliefs. Islam has a high regard for Jesus, considering him a prophet and a sinless man. However, it denies him his rightful place as a son of God and payment for our sin. Muslims may be devout and earnest in their beliefs, but just like everyone else, they're in desperate need of salvation. Talk a little bit more about this later. So back to the story. The Muslim conquest of 651 AD changed the game in Iran, transforming its political and religious landscape. But many Iranians today are still resisting Muslim influence. Yeah, so, I mean, Persian culture goes back a lot. I mean, we see it in the, in, in, in the Bible too. When Islam actually came to Iran, 
and the Islamic way impacted Iran, slowly and slowly we adapt the culture. But if, when you go back to the root, we are Persians. That's how Iranian would look at it. You say we are Persians, we are not Arabs. We are not, it's not that, you know, being Arab is bad, no, but we have our own identity. So Islam was not part of our culture. We had our own culture. Now Iranians actually wanted to regain that culture again. So they are opposing to Islamic way and thinking because we think, okay, this is for another world. This is my friend Nima Alisale. Before he became a believer, he was also a star athlete in Iran, not in wrestling, but playing for the national basketball team. When he converted to Christianity, he was forced to leave his home in dreams of playing professional basketball. But the Lord took him on a different path, training Iranian church leaders for gospel ministry and translating a whole bunch of resources into Farsi. He knows firsthand what it's like to grow up under the heavy weight of Islam in Iran. When you go to a school, for example, you have to learn Arabic to be able to read the Quran and then pray five times in Arabic. So still you have no idea what you're talking about, but you're just, you know, rehearsing something every day. You have no idea what you're talking about. And then we say, okay, like 2000 years ago, we had this in Farsi. Why can't we just keep that culture? Why can't we just be Persians and have the freedom of having our own God and, and worshiping, you know, God in the way that we want to, you know, worship our God. When your country is so culturally rich and historically influential for outsiders to only see you as Muslim, it's a bit insulting. While there are many people groups within Iran, Persians in particular have existed for thousands of years before anybody who spoke Arabic ever entered their land. All of this is crucial to understanding Iran's history, and even to understand what's happening with Christians today. Islam may be Iran's national religion, but it wasn't always that way. It's not even what most Iranians want today. Quick break from the rest of the video. We're currently in Tehran, in Shah Park, really close to the Grand Palace, the Grand Bazaar, and uh, it's incredible. The hospitality, the kindness we have faced in this country. A lot of people look at uh, Iran and maybe don't have the best impression, but really when you get here, you realize how much the media probably doesn't tell you the full story. So I'm guessing the majority of people watching this haven't been to and aren't planning on going to Iran anytime soon. And if that's the case, I just want to let you in on a little something. There's something just lovely and unique about the people of Iran. They're truth seekers. They're really not afraid to ask you questions, even hard questions, but at the same time, they're very warm and inviting. Culturally, you just don't know hospitality until you've experienced Persian hospitality. I mean, I was walking through a park here in Tehran when a woman approached me and for no other reason than seeing that I was from out of town, invited me to sit with her family, drink tea, and eat sweets. I mean, I think every Christian can learn something about hospitality from our Iranian brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter how far or different a place may seem to us, the image of God is everywhere and it's beautiful to see. And it's why this story matters so much. All right, back to the story. It's December 1979, and after years of political instability and public demonstrations, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi was overthrown and forced to leave the country. You see, Pahlavi was no stranger to Western influence. He was, after all, a huge proponent of secularization. And if you watch historical footage of Iran in the 60s and 70s, you'll notice it doesn't look all that different than some places in Europe and even the US. And while initially many supported Pahlavi, the satisfaction grew, particularly among Muslims who felt that that Western influence had gotten too strong. Not to mention that the Shah's opulent lifestyle left many wondering how he could throw such lavish parties while the people were going hungry. All of this led to the point of no return. The Shah was deposed and in came the Islamic Republic's new Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. Things were about to drastically change for the people of Iran. Beginning with a new leader, a new Islamic constitution that would shape the life of every citizen moving forward, meaning no more religious freedom. Islam is the rule of law. And most of all, a new name. 
the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, I want to talk about what this actually means for believers in Iran. And I know that talking about government structures may not be the most exciting thing, but it is really relevant for our story here. And so let me take one minute to break down what it means to live under an Islamic Republic. As a Republic and as part of the UN, Iran technically has a separation of powers. There's an elected president, a constitution, a parliament of 290 elected officials. These officials represent all the people groups of Iran. And there are even three seats reserved for leaders of traditionally Christian backgrounds. There's a chief justice, police, and armed forces. Everything a typical government needs to function. But let's go back to that word, Islamic. Being an Islamic Republic means that the latter is subject to the former. Yes, Iran has a president. But above the president, there is a supreme leader known as the Ayatollah, which means a sign from God. And the Ayatollah can approve or remove any president at any time. He sits at the top of the Guardian Council, which approves or removes every member of parliament. He supervises the special clerical court that handles religious and clerical matters. He appoints the chief justice and, you guessed it, the police and armed forces answer to him as well. Iran is one of only three Islamic republics in the world. And when you get down to it, you can see how it doesn't actually function like a republic at all. But here's why this matters. For the last 40 years, politics and religion in Iran have been one and the same. It's the Islamic Republic of Iran. So the main religion is Islam. So you cannot have any other religion rather than Islam. So when you are born in Iran, you are told you are a Muslim. You have to practice Islam. So and that's your religion by birth. Islam is not a choice. It's what you're forcibly born into. And in people's minds, the rule of the government and the rule of Islam are the same thing. There is no separation between the church and state. And while that has elevated the level of persecution against Christians and other religious groups, it's also had one huge unexpected consequence. And I'll say it like this. The Islamic regime came to power at a time when people were looking for hope for the future. And they came on a wave of promises that things would change for the better. But that didn't happen. For example, the promise of the religious leader in Iran uh, never take place in Iran. And it causes that people search about, the, for example, truth in the other way, you know? Because be before that, Iranian was so strong in Islam. But after the Islamic Revolution, they found out there is nothing in this Islam. They were disappointed by it. Yes. This is Ramdin Sudman. Ramdin is an Iranian pastor who recently had to flee his home because of persecution. He's also the son of the first Christian martyr who was officially killed by the Iranian government after the Islamic Revolution took place. So what happened after the Iranian Revolution? The excitement caused by establishment of the first republic regime based on the law of Islamic Sharia and the hope of creating utopia so quickly faded in the eyes of many Iranians because not only all social problems, despite the initial promise of the religious leaders of the Iranian revolution, such as the poverty, discrimination, corruption, never disappear, but also all problems were clearly visible in Iran's society more than before. And this caused an answer question among Iranians. The Islamic regime was not able to deliver on its promises to build a better country. And the disillusionment and disappointment people felt after wasn't only with their government, but with Islam itself. And for people whose culture values the search for truth, this led many on a search for truth elsewhere, particularly in Christianity. It was in many ways the first step towards revival. Perhaps the cropped fruit of Iran's government had a bitter taste of people, but it never tired them of searching for the truth. The positive evidence and good testimony of the life of the Armenian and Christian community in Iran during the years draw a lot of attention to 
Christianity and Mardi Gras right yet. There's this quote by C.S. Lewis in his book, Miracles. He says, Every good chess player takes what is precisely the strong point in his opponent's plan and makes it the pivot of his own plan. He takes his opponent's best move and makes it work in his own favor. He makes unpredictable moves. This is kind of the pattern of persecution that we see across the world and in places like Iran. God's enemies will do everything in their power to crush the gospel, but somehow God turns it around and makes it work in his own favor to advance the gospel. And so if you take away anything from this first episode, it should be that life for Christians in Iran is not easy. And that's a huge understatement. But we also need to acknowledge that life is not easy for Iranians in general living under the Islamic regime. There is a long list of urgent physical and spiritual needs. And yet God is doing something incredible and unpredictable here in Iran, which we'll dive into in the next episode.